As I always say, you know, each and every one of you, I love all of you and the things I've designed tonight is always given to me first and foremost. Tonight's lesson is a simple one, but one we all want. The title of tonight's lesson is, Do You Want Real Change in Your Life? Now, what gave me the idea for this is a little thing came up on my feed for one of my online things, and it kind of caught my attention. It says, people in life typically don't like change until things stop going their way. Then change because all welcome. That's pretty true, isn't it? In life, most of us, we don't like change, especially the older we get and the few more years we get on us. We like things to be just as so easy, calm, and steady. But when things aren't going good, boy, that change, it can't come fast enough. So it gave me the idea for this lesson. In life, people want real change. When it's things with their life, they are going to want real change. And not only do they want change, they're going to work for it. Think about anything in life that takes real legitimate change. Life altering change. People, every time the calendar flips over to January 1st, what do we start doing? New Year's resolutions. And what's one of those resolutions? It's always to lose weight, isn't it? And if anyone knows, if you're going to go for real change, it's going to take a real effort. Does that weight just magically drop off? It doesn't, does it? They have to stick with it. Any change is going to require real effort. You want a promotion at work? You've got to work hard to get it. You've got to be noticed by the boss. You've got to do things to earn that promotion. We work really hard a lot of times to earn real change. But think about it in life. All these things we strive for. That diet you work so hard, even if you do stick with it, which most folks don't, but even if you do and you drop that weight, think about it. It's only temporary, isn't it? You could look great for 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 years. But eventually, your metabolism is going to slow down. Eventually, your body is going to start breaking down. You're going to age. Temporary, isn't it? Think about that promotion you worked so hard to gain. And that recognition, that status, that name on the outside of your door that you worked so many years to get. What happens eventually? Eventually you got to retire. Eventually you give up that job and someone else takes that office and your nameplate comes down. Everything we do in this life that we want change, it's only temporary. But the real change in your life comes from God Almighty. And that's the change that we should be really striving for. Because the things in this life are going to end, folks. Everything you strive for, all the changes you look to try to gain, all the things in your life that you want that are going to make a difference in your mind are all going to end. What did Solomon tell us? It's all vanity. All that's under the sun is vanity. And it's true, isn't it? The things we chase, the things we want so desperately, so badly in this life are all going to end. When you really think about it, it's all vanity. Solomon had to live an entire life, didn't he, to come to that resolution. He had to make a lot of bad, bad mistakes and fall about as far away from God as you can to come to that realization that the only thing that really matters is God Almighty. So tonight, do we want real change in our life? Not change that's going to last while we're here, but change that's going to last forever. If so, number one, I have tonight, if we want real change in our life, number one is we have to start by living honestly. Boy, that's something in this life, isn't it? <laughs> How many folks in this life can you say that you genuinely truthfully and honestly believe. That list is pretty small, isn't it? Usually makes up family, close friends, confidence. 
But when you flip on that TV screen and you see folks that are telling you what's best for you, changes that need to be made, how often do you believe it? So in our life, how important is truth? It's very important, isn't it? Because we don't get a whole lot of it. People today trust nothing. Absolutely nothing and no one. But God wants us to trust in Him. And the first real step to getting real change in your life is to start living honestly. Listen to what Peter tells us. He gives us the secret to a good life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. There he says that he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and let him keep his lips that they speak no guile. Well, that sounds pretty good, that first part, doesn't it? He that will love life and see good days. Boy, we all want a piece of that. People spend thousands of dollars on do-it-yourself books, self-help books, seminars, counselors. They go through all kinds of things in life trying to find what's the secret to a good life. Peter's given it to us right here in one verse. If you want to love life, you want to see good days? Start by living an honest life. Start by keeping your tongue and reframing it, keeping it away from evil things. Simply put, Peter saying, stop commuting with things you know are ungodly. When you go into that beauty shop and you hear people gossiping about Joe or Betty down the street, don't get involved. When you start hearing people talking about God and running Christ down and running things down, do we stand up for it? Start by living honestly with yourself. And the last part he says there, keep those lips that they speak no guile. What's guile, folks? It's lies, deceit. Simply put, Peter's saying here, start living your life by stop lying to others. Stop lying to yourself and stop lying to the Almighty. Remember back in Acts, the fifth chapter, when you go through those first few verses of the chapter, we talk about Ananias and Sapphira and they kept back part of the price, didn't they? They said that they were going to sell all that they had and they were going to bring it and lay it at the disciples' feet. But what'd they do? They kept back part, didn't they? They weren't really buying this whole Christianity thing. They weren't really buying this whole giving up everything. So they thought they were going to ride the fence like a politician. They're going to give part of it to the disciples, but keep part back in case this thing kind of falls through. And what did Peter say to Ananias at the time? You didn't lie to me. You lied to God. That's something we think about, isn't it? You know, in this life, a lot of times people say, well, it's a little white lie. It was harmless. You know, I, I just said it to spare feelings. I just said it to, to keep from having a hard time. It was a little white lie. No big deal. Nobody was any the wiser. God was. Just as Peter said, you didn't lie to me. I love how Peter took that approach in life. Isn't that great? If somebody came up to you and you know that they were lying to your face, you knew that they were being deceitful with you, how hard would it be even as a Christian to take the attitude that Peter took right here? The attitude of, well, I don't care that you lied to me. You lied to God. That's what I care about. How honest are we being in our life right now, folks? Are we going through our day-to-day -day life and can say that we are truthfully and honestly leading a life for God? Can we say that we are reframing our tongue? We are not communing in things we know are ungodly and untruthful. Can we honestly say that we're not lying to others in our life, lying to ourselves, and lying to God? You want that first step towards a better life? Start by living it honestly. And Jesus Christ tells us the same thing. In John the 8th chapter, verse 31 and 32. There he told the Jews that were believing on him at the time that if you abide in my word, you are my disciples truthfully. 
And they that know the truth, the truth shall make them free. That says a lot, doesn't it? They that know the truth, they shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free. What's the truth, folks? Well, the truth is there is a God. He created you and everything you see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. There is a heaven. There will be a hell and guaranteed there is a judgment. So therefore, you and I will have to answer for the honest or dishonest actions of our life, every last one of them. Jesus Christ kept it pretty simple, didn't he? Once those folks believed on him, just as you and I pledged our allegiance to Christ when we dipped in that watery baptism, that was the truth, folks. That was the day when our eyes were open, when we woke up. And we finally realized what the truth was. That there is a God. That I believe that Jesus Christ is his son. And I'm going to pledge the rest of my life to try to serve him the best I can. Do we remember that pledge? Are we still holding to it? Are we honestly walking in the steps of the Savior? How much do we remember the oath of that day? Does it still guide our life? Are we still honestly walking those steps? Yeah, Christ kept it pretty simple. Those that believe in me, they're going to know the truth. And the truth is going to set them free. Once we've learned something, folks, once we've been enlightened to something in life, do you ever want to go back to a time where you don't know? When someone revealed to you that there is a God, that there will be an eternal life for those that lead a godly life, do we ever want to go back to a time where we don't have that? That's being truthful, isn't it? That's the honest and truthful way of leading a Christian life. There is a God. There is a Savior. And there will be an eternal judgment. Where are we going to end up on that side of the fence? It's like a test you take in school a lot of times. When you take a test a lot of times, there's three different kinds of people. When the test day comes, there's the guy that studied all night and he's ready. There's the guy that somewhat studied, maybe glimpsed over things, skimmed over things, and feels that maybe they can do enough to get by. And then there's the guy that didn't study at all. And they know they're going to fail. Which one are we in our Christian life? If we honestly and truthfully ask ourselves that question, if the exam of the judgment came today, am I the guy that studied and I'm ready for the test? Am I the guy that put in a half-hearted effort and lied to myself in thinking that doing a ho-hum effort for God was going to get me by? Or are we the one that doesn't do nearly enough and know we don't do enough and know we're going to fail if the Lord came tonight? You want that step towards a real change in your life? Towards a real change towards an eternal life? Start by living your life honestly for God. Number two. We want to have a better life, a real change in our life. Number two, I have stop demanding of God, but start honoring God's demands. Boy, here's one we're all guilty of a lot of times. is Living a life where we demand of God. How many of us, when we go to God in prayer, it, does it sound like this? Lord, I need you to do this, 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 and this. I need you to do this for this person, this for that person, this for me. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that we're to pray without ceasing. Well, we know that one pretty well. We got that nailed as Christians. Pray without ceasing. Every time something goes wrong, every time things come along in our life that are a little tough, boy, we nail that one. But look at the very next verse. Verse 18. In all things, give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How often do we live up to the second part? The next verse. How often do we honor God and Jesus Christ in those prayers? How often do we say thanks? For every single thing we're given on a daily basis. Not just when things really go good. Not when just things are really sailing our way. But the smallest little things in life. When our feet hit the floor. And food hits our mouth. Before we go to bed at night. How often are we just simply saying thank you. For another day in your life. And number two. You want to start taking that giant step towards having. A better life. Real change in your life. Stop demanding of God and start honoring God's demands. Once again, we go to Peter. First Peter, still in that third chapter, now verse 12. There God and Jesus Christ tell us that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. Once again, in life, how many times, even as Christians, do we live a life of demanding of God? Well, we're going to God in prayer. We feel like we're righteous. We're doing all the right things. We're going to Him in prayer. We expect those prayers to be answered. It's our right. We're a Christian. Why isn't God meeting this demand? How close to Him are we in the moment of prayer? Because His face is against those that do evil. Simply His face is against those that are sinning. His face is against those that are in a state of sin. A state of disobeying Him. A state of not living up to our potential. As a good person once told me, who's sitting in the audience, people want grounds for prayer, but are we on praying ground? Pretty truthful statement, isn't it? A lot of folks in life will say, well, I have grounds for prayer. I'm a Christian. I come to church every Sunday. I crack open my Bible once in a while. I have grounds for prayer. I have grounds for those prayers to be answered. But are we on praying ground at that moment? Are we also Monday through Saturday doing things in our life we shouldn't? Sinning willfully against God. Not repenting of those sins. Being involved in things we never should be. You want to take another giant step as we said to get a real change in your life? Stop demanding of God and start living by God's demands. Because the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. The true and honest righteous children of God. And his ear is open unto their prayers. He's willing to consider the prayers of those who are willfully living for him. Is that something we think about? Do we have God's ear? Or are we a person that puts in a ho-hum half-hearted effort? But expects God to listen when we need this, 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 and this. Our list of demands that our prayer turns out to be. Jesus Christ reminds us of this as well. John 15, verse 14. There Christ simply says, Ye are my friends if you keep my commandments. You're my friends. In our life right now as a Christian, can we honestly say the Savior is our friend? What entails a friend? A friend knows everything about your life mostly, don't they? They're ones you hurry to pick up the phone and tell when good news happens. They're the ones you run to and pick up the phone when bad things happen. You ever had a friend in life that was all one-sided? Every time you picked up that phone, it was just rah, 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 about them. What they do, what they like, what their kids do, what their grandkids do. And you never get a word in. How long does it take in that state when that keeps going on and on and on and on for week after week, month after month, year after year, that gets pretty old, doesn't it? A one-sided friendship. Is that us with Jesus Christ? 
Is it a one-sided relationship? Is it Christ do this for me, do that for me? What I need, my life, what I want? Where does He come in? How often, how much time are we dedicating in the week to reading His words, to taking on His life? We want real change. We've got to stop demanding of God and stop demanding of Christ and start by living by their demands because they're the ones that are ultimately in control of our life. They're the ones that can direct and guide your life towards something much greater. Not somebody out here. Yes, in our life right now, if we want real change in our life as a Christian, we have to stop making demands of God and start living by God's demand. And folks, number three, if we want real and honest change in our life, are we genuine in our faith? What is faith? God's word tells us. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. Do we believe that? Is that genuine in our heart? Do we honestly believe there is a God up there? There is a heaven. There will be an eternal life for me. Or are we just hoping it kind of is? Is our faith absolutely 100% genuine? Because if you want real change in your life, it's never going to happen until the day you accept that God is for real. That Christ is there. He's just waiting to start directing your life if you'll take him on in it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The reason we sit in these pews, the reason we take of these communion to represent the body and blood of our Savior that hung on a cross to give us the chance to sit here tonight with hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things we've never seen. We have never seen God's face. We've never heard his voice. We've never seen Christ's face or his voice. Do we believe that they're real? Because that's what faith is. Belief in what you can't see. What did Christ tell Thomas back in John the 20th chapter? You've seen these things and you believe. But blessed are they that don't see these things and believe. Thomas was like the world, wasn't he? What Christ? Well, yeah, sure. Sure, he resurrected from the dead. Sure, I'll believe it. Well, I can put my fingers in the nail holes and I can thrust my hand in the side. Then I'll believe it. That's the world, isn't it? Yeah, sure, there's a Savior. Sure, there was a guy that lived 2,000 years ago that resurrected on the third day. Yeah, right. No, we evolved from apes. The world just got here from a big bang and we're all and we die. That's it. We just close our eyes. They sew them shut. You better live up and do what you want to do while you're here because that's all that matters. That's the world. Thomas was being worldly in that moment, wasn't he? It was doubt. But what did Christ say? Blessed are they that don't see these things and believe. It took literally touching and feeling and seeing with his own eyes for Thomas to say, my Lord and my God. He had to see it. He had to physically touch it to be there. But Christ was chastising him. He said, blessed are they that don't see these things and believe because their faith is genuine. Is that us? We're never going to see God's face or Christ's face until that final day, folks. Do we believe it's there? Do, believe, do we believe they're the ones directing our life? That they're the ones that grace us with every blessing we have? That's genuine. Because if we do, folks, we're on the right track. We're on the best track towards real change, not only in this life, but in the twinkling of an eye when our body is changed in that final day. And folks, we know that faith should be genuine. 
And Paul reminds us of this as well in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses one through four. There Paul says that we are to remember the day that we gave our life over to Christ. Once again, we're returning to this. He says that how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I love how he starts it though. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What's Paul saying? You know differently. If your faith is truly genuine, what shall we say? Shall we go through life and sin willingly? Knowing that there's a heaven, knowing that there's a judgment? That we and expect that grace is going to abound in our life? God forbid. Paul's giving us a moment of crazy here, isn't he? He's saying, you're crazy if you think that going through life, sinning willfully, continuing in that life once you've known differently is going to lead to grace abounding, to blessings and good things abounding in your life. God forbid. That is crazy, isn't it? Anyone that knows the truth, we've been set free. We've been made free because we know differently, don't we? And he goes on to remind us there that we were buried with him by baptism. That like Christ was raised from the dead, so too shall, should we rise to walk in newness of life. On that day, if your heart was genuine, if your faith was genuine, that was the beginning of your life. Not the day you entered this world and a doctor cut the umbilical cord. No, the day your life truly began is when you raised out of that watery baptism. And you were supposed to. I love the word should. That should be double underlined. We should rise to walk a newness life. Does that mean every single person that went under the water was truthful, was genuine in their faith? Absolutely not. And sadly, so many of them that once filled these pews and pews like these are no longer with us because they got lost somewhere along the way. Yes, folks, in our life right now, if we want real change, we need to go back to where our life began. The day we said we believe Christ is the Son of God and we rose out of that baptistry. That was the day that you should rise to walk in newness of life. Are we doing it right now? Do you want real change in your life as a Christian right now? If so, we have to start by living our life honestly. If we're living our life honestly, then we have to continue by not demanding of God, but living by God's demands. And number three, we have to remember that our faith needs to be genuine because Christ doesn't want pretenders in heaven. No, he tells us in Matthew, the seventh chapter, that on that day, there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do many good things in your name? Didn't I prophesy? Didn't I cast out devils? Christ is going to say, I never knew you. I didn't know who you were. You were a stranger to me. Your faith was not genuine to me. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. The most chilling words any Christian will ever hear. Do we want real change in our life tonight? If so, Start by doing these things. The lesson's yours. Folks, if there's anyone here tonight who's heard God's word and has been moved to believe it, you now have the chance to come forward to let God know you've heard, that you believe, repent of the sins you've committed in life, confess you believe that Jesus crowned a God and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. Or if for some reason you feel like you're not as close to God that you're not in the right place you want to be in your life and you want to make a change, there are faithful men here to pray that you might make that change tonight. If you have either one of those needs, won't you come as we sing the song of invitation.